Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. Very early on in All Things Are Possible, Lev Shestov is going to speak of the law of sequence in natural phenomena, and that is sort of a stand-in for causality. One of the things that modern philosophy, well, actually philosophy in general since the ancient time, but particularly in modern philosophy they were concerned about is causality as an issue. And we see this, for example, in David Hume and his considerations of cause and effect, and then in Kant, who's responding to Hume, and so many other thinkers as well. And Shestov, he's not saying that there aren't causes and effects, but he is thinking that things are quite a bit more complex than we take them to, to be. Uh, at one point he says that generally when there's some sort of thing that we observe, it's a bunch of different causes coming together and we pick out the one that's to us the most obvious and then thereby get things wrong. In the very beginning of All Things Are Possible, he's got a, a very interesting discussion of this law of sequence, of things following each other in regular order. And he says, it seems so plausible, so obvious, that we're tempted to look for its origin, not in the realities of actual life, but in the promptings of the human mind. This is the idea that causality is in some way a priori. It's, it's a necessary way in which we see the universe in front of us and the experiences that we undergo and how we connect them together. And then he says, this law of sequence is actually the most mysterious of all the natural laws. Why so much order? Why not chaos and disorderliness? Really, if the hypothesis of sequence had not offered such blatant advantages to the human intelligence, man would never have thought of raising it to the rank of eternal and irrefutable truth, but he saw his opportunity. So what he's saying here is that, you know, if you think about things, there's really no, no fundamental grounding reason why things actually have to work in regular order and succession. You can come up with reasonings about that, as people have done throughout the ages, but a lot of that is based on our willingness to buy into that or our need for things to be regular like that or it's drawing conclusions from our experience which is never vast enough to really draw many conclusions from and so he goes on and he says thanks to this grand hypothesis man is forewarned and forearmed thanks to this master key the future is at his mercy he knows in order that he may foreknow savoir pour prévoir, right? And so this is one grand motif in why we're so into causality. It lets us feel like the future is in some degree in our hands, determined. We can count on it. Now, is that always the case? It's the case sometimes, but there's so many other things that can come along and disrupt matters. He also says that uh, here is man, by virtue of one supreme assumption, dictator henceforth of all nature. And then he says, philosophers have ever bowed the knee to success, so down they went before the newly invented law of natural sequence, and they hailed it with the title of eternal truth. So that was, that was in his view, kind of a mistake, a going beyond what they ought to have done, but understandable because philosophers, like other human beings, like what seems to be successful. And if we look at the history of philosophy, we see all sorts of ideas adopted throughout the ages, even down to the present, which are much more, you could say, convenient or satisfying emotional needs than necessarily true, or they're just part of the general culture. And so this helps to explain why we're, we're so big on this. And 
you know, it's interesting. He follows this up with, with a thing in, in chapter 3. He says, the comfortable, settled person says to themselves, how could one live without being sure of the morrow? How could one sleep without a roof over one's head? So this is like a, a way of being, you know, that has a regular sequence. And then he says, and then misfortune turns him out of house and home. He has to sleep under a hedge. He cannot rest. He's full of terrors. There may be wild beasts, fellow tramps. But in the long run, he gets used to it. He will trust himself to chance, live like a tramp, and sleep his sleep in the ditch. So there's, you know, we often make the mistake of thinking like we've figured out the way things have to be, you know, following sort of regular laws and rules and stuff like that. And it turns out that's not the case at all. We can adapt ourselves to all sorts of things. He has some other discussions about this a little bit later on. Uh, this is in uh, part two, chapter 16. And he says that this is a certain thing that happens at certain times of life, although other people could get jaded earlier or later. A man comes to the past where all experience seems exhausted. Wherever he go, whatever he see, all is old and wearingly familiar. Most people explain this by saying that they really know everything and that from what they have experienced, they can infer all experience. So this is a, a very common mistake, and it's made pretty much in every culture and every, every time. We can see all sorts of examples of this throughout the history of human beings. We might even have experienced it ourselves or in those who we know. They think it's just repetition. It's all the same. We've got it finally figured out. Again, sequence, consequence, causality. You understand the causes and effects of things. He says this, this phase of the exhaustion of life usually comes to a man between 35 and 40, not seeing anything new. The individual assumes he is completely matured and has the right to judge of everything. Knowing what has been, he can forecast what will be. And Shostov calls this a spiritual stagnation. Uh, and he says, you shouldn't take this spiritual stagnation as a sort of ratification, first of all, that you've actually got it right, and that you can judge all of life's possibilities from the known possibilities, because your range of what you've actually seen is actually going to be quite small. And he says, on the contrary, However rich and multifarious the past may have been, it's not exhausted a little bit, the whole of the possibilities. From that which has been, it is impossible to infer what will be. So this is a, a denial of anything like strict causality, at least in human affairs. Knowing the past, knowing the present, having had experiences, is not enough to tell you how things are going to be in the future. We might think about our own time and the massive transformations that we've undergone ourselves. And he says that um, it's also unnecessary, except perhaps to give us a sense of our full maturity and let us enjoy the charms of the best period of life. This temptation is not overwhelming. So if you're under the necessity of enduring a period of arrest and stagnation, and until such a time as life restarts being doomed to meditation, would it not be better to use this meditating uh, interregnum for a directly opposite purpose, for finding in our past signs, which tell us that the future has every right to be anything whatsoever, like or unlike the past. And so then he goes on and he, he, he actually starts drawing conclusions not just about human affairs. He says, at times one comes to the conclusion that the natural connection of phenomena as hitherto observed is not at all inevitable for the future. And miracles, which so far have seemed impossible, may come to seem possible, even natural, far more natural than that law, that loathsome law of sequence, the law of the regularity of phenomena. So this is a possibility for us. We don't have to sort of bend the knee to what has been hitherto the success of the law of sequence of phenomena. We, things could be different. Things have been different. People get surprised all the time. And it's not just because they didn't understand all the factors. Nobody understands all the factors, right? And here he says something else that I think is quite interesting. He says, we're bored stiff with regularity and sequence. Confess it. You also 
men of science. You also, the people who are pushing this point of view, that we, we've got it all figured out. It's just a matter of sort of like filling in the boxes and drawing the proper lines. You're bored with this too. This is a, a very important existential theme, the idea that the introduction of lots and lots of rationality and regularity into life actually stifles us. And he says that, um, at the mere thought that however we may think, you can get no further than the acknowledgement of the old regularity an invincible disgust to any kind of mental work overcomes us. We want more out of life than that. And he says, to discover another law when already we have far more than we can do with. Surely if there's any will to think left in us, it is established in the supposition that the mind cannot and must not have any bounds, any limits. And so we see this, this constantly happening within the history of ideas and of human beings and culture themselves. Everybody, somebody's got it all figured out. You have this regularity and then boom, things come along and that cracks open and we discover new ways of doing things. And you might actually, I mean, you can also turn this, by the way, in our own time into its own sort of law of regularity. We're going to like figure out innovation and disruption. We always have to be at the cutting edge. Those people are just as boring as the people who are stuck in the mud back here who are like regularity, regularity, regularity. Because they all say the same damn thing over and over and over again, right? The same buzzwords, the same laws that they think they've figured out. So interestingly, in our time, even the people who are stressing like, uh, you know, being yourself and, you know, being a disruptor or something like that, they're just as, as tied to this as anybody else. And, and you can see that by the appeals that they'll often make when they get pushed to like neuroscience right? <laughs> or other things that are supposed to be uh, determining regularity and helping us understand things. He also talks about this to some degree in uh, chapter one, uh, part one, chapter 33. He says, the possibilities which open out before mankind are sufficiently limited. It's impossible to see everything, impossible to know everything, impossible to rise too high above the earth, impossible to penetrate too deeply down. We're always stuck not knowing more things than we know, and we don't even know how much we don't know. So he says, regularity, immutably regular succession of phenomena, puts a term to our efforts, drives us into a regular, narrow, hard-beaten road of everyday life. Even on this road, we may not wander from side to side. We must watch our feet, consider each step, since the moment we are off our guard, danger, the disaster is upon us. And so, you know, regularity, it's kind of funny because we're being, you know, we're experiencing it, we're having it pushed upon us, and yet it's not enough to compel us. We have to be careful to make sure that we stay regular, right? We, we have to stay on the road, even though the road has long been established for us. Why? Well, he goes on and he says, another life is conceivable. Life in which, in which the word disaster does not exist, where the responsibility for one's actions, even if it's not completely abolished, at least has not such a deadly and accidental weight. And where, on the other hand, there is no regularity, but an infinite number of possibilities. There's always possibilities that are not being realized. And we could, we could grab them, even if they, it seems to violate the law of succession, which shows us that the law of succession is not such a strict, eternal, immutable law as it's being portrayed. The bold and the timid, sometimes accidentally stumbling into it, often discover this. There's another uh, place where he's talking about this, and I like to call it the parable of the pike. It's actually my favorite passage of this work. Um, he begins it by talk, it, it, he titles this, this section on method. And he says, there's an experiment. A glass jar is divided into two halves by a, a glass partition on the one side of the partition. So we're thinking about a huge fish tank, right? He places a pike. So if you don't know what a pike is, it's a predatory fish that exists uh, in Europe, uh, in, in Asia, and in North America. 
Um, the muscalunge is an example that we have here. We have the northern pike, and then there's the ammer pike and the pickerel. And they have mouths that are full of teeth, generally uh, dripping with anticoagulants. So if you get bitten by one, it's, it's a bad bite. And they are aggressive because of their shape. When they actually start swimming at fish, they can go up to like 20 uh, miles an hour for very brief bursts under the water. And they're, they're hunters who like to hang out. And then when they see something, they go out and they get it. And it can be another fish. It can even be another pike. It can be ducklings. It can be all sorts of things. And so you've got a pike and then you've got these other small fish that would be the pike's prey. The pike doesn't notice the partition and it, it goes to try to get the fish and it bumps into the glass and it hurts its nose. And it does this over and over and over again. And after a while, the pike stops going after the fish. It realizes there's a invisible partition there that is going to cause pain for it. Then they pull the partition up. Now, what do you think happens? The pike has learned a lesson. If I go after these fish, it hurts my nose. I'm not going to do that. And he says, at last, seeing its efforts ending so painfully, it abandoned the hunt. When the partition had been removed, it continued to swim about the small fry without daring to attack them. Shestov says, does not the same happen with us, with our experience, with being told that this is the way things are? Perhaps the limits between this world and the other world are also essentially of an experimental origin, not rooted in the nature of things as was thought before Kant or in the nature of our reason as was thought after Kant. Maybe a partition does exist and makes vain all attempts to cross over, but maybe there's a moment where this partition is removed. In our minds, we've already got the conviction rooted, that it's impossible to pass certain limits and painful to try. A conviction formed on experience. And then he suggests, in this case, we should return to David Hume's old skepticism. David Hume said, first of all, that causality didn't really exist as such. Uh, and then he also said that if we can imagine things differently, they could be differently. There's a possibility, we can't say with necessity, that anything experiential must be the way it is. And he says, um, the most lasting and varied experience cannot lead to any binding and universal conclusion. Our a priori, which are so useful for a certain time, become sooner or later extremely harmful. A philosopher should not be afraid of skepticism, but should go on bruising his jaw. Isn't that an interesting idea? To be a genuine philosopher would mean continuing to experiment, continuing to try to figure things out, and going against this law, these laws that say, oh, it can only be this way. We figured out the causes of things. And this is indeed why philosophers are so often you know, irritating and unwelcome among people in the other disciplines because people in the other disciplines, are like, we've figured things out. Psychology, we, we know, you know how rewards and punishments affect people. So when it comes to this or that, we're, you know, we're going to arrange it and it'll all work out. And then the philosopher comes along and says, oh, interesting assumptions there. Are you sure about that? What if we tried doing this? Or let's just do a thought experiment. And then they're like, shut up, get out of here. We're already done with, the, with the figuring things out. So the parable of the pike is, is quite powerful, I'd say. Um, the other thing that's, that's very interesting in this book is that Shestov also talks about this as how it applies to thinkers, writers, and perspectives, like philosophical perspectives on things. And he's got this amazing uh, discussion, uh, which is completely, as far as I can tell, correct about um, masters and disciples and ideas. In the realm of ideas, we often apply something like a, a law of causality. So, well, you know, somebody had these things going on at the time, therefore, this is why their philosophy looks the way it is. And then we also do this with, well, you know, uh, Spinoza was a Cartesian. As a good Cartesian, he must have thought this, and then he went on and added these things, and... So this is what he calls theories of sequence and consequence. And he says, these are binding only on disciples, not upon the masters. Why? Uh, Fathers of great ideas tend to be careless about their progeny, giving very little heed to their future career. The offspring of one and the same philosopher bear, frequently bear su small, such small resemblance to one another, it's impossible to discern the family connection. Fertile, productive minds 
are like drawn in a million different directions and doing lots of different things. So you think about Plato, for example, right? Plato is both a disciple and a master. And actually, insofar as he's a disciple of Socrates, he's, he's doing stuff that kind of follows from what Socrates is doing. And then he brings in all sorts of ideas of his own and you know, weaves them into these amazing dialogues, which as Nietzsche recognized are a new genre, uh, practically speaking. And you know, Nietzsche saw it as sort of you know, a way of cobbling together the shipwreck of the previous ways of, of doing literature. Um, Plato didn't actually consult anybody and say, well, how should I be doing things? How should I write my dialogues? Should I write dialogues or should I write academic papers published in a peer-reviewed journal? with you know, reviewer one and reviewer two or something. No, he didn't do anything like that. And then you know, we have followers, and oftentimes followers are, are you know, doing interesting things, expanding uh, the, the scope. Great example of this is Aristotle's good friend Theophrastus, who, was, uh, who traveled with him, helped found the Lyceum, um, carried through some of Aristotle's massive research projects, uh, but doesn't appear to have been a particularly original thinker, whereas Aristotle was, right? So he says that conscientious disciples wasting away under the arduous effort to discover what doesn't exist are brought to despair of their task. Having got an inkling of the truth concerning their difficulties, they give up the job forever. They cease their attempt at reconciling glaring contradictions. But then they insist the, only the harder on the necessity of studying the philosophers, studying them minutely, circumstantially, historically, philologically even. So the history of philosophy is born, which is now, he says, taking the place of history. And so we have people who can tell you all about, you know, almost, <laughs> this is a facetious example, what, what Hegel ate on this morning over here, but they can't actually do Hegel. They're, they're sort of cut off from that, the spirit of Hegel's Great work. Very often, some of the best commentators on philosophers are not the ones who like get it all right about the past, but who sees on the vital experience of that that philosopher's ideas and what it's like to think the world through their sometimes contradictory lenses. And so disciples are very different than masters. We can, we can say that disciples actually do follow and, and impose the law of sequence and consequence. Um, he says, for a good translation or a commentary on the chief works of Kant, on Kant, a man may be given the degree of doctor of philosophy and here henceforth recognizes one who's initiated in the profundities of the secret of the universe, right? But Kant is something different than that. Reading Kant is is if you actually understand what you're reading, a, a, an experience of great depth. You might be wrong about some stuff, but you're like, wow, this guy is thinking some thoughts, right? Reading secondary literature on Kant doesn't really have that experience. And if all you do, by the way, is read the secondary literature or intro texts or textbooks or stuff like that, and you don't read the actual philosophers, well, you're really missing out on something. Same as you would be if you don't read Dostoevsky but only read Cliff's Notes or whatever other you know, digests of, of that you, you can do. The last thing that he talks about with this um, realm of thinkers is he's, he's actually praising the kids of his time. Uh, this is in... Uh, Part 2, Chapter 35, and he says that uh, people are jumping from perspective to perspective. He talks about this in terms of evolution, right? And he says, in recent years, we see more and more a change in the philosophies of writers and even non-literary people. The old men are beside themselves. Such shiftiness seems indifferent. Convictions are not gloves, right? You put one on, take one off. But the young carelessly pass on from one idea to another, People announce how far they are now from the beliefs they held six months ago. One even publishes volumes relating how you pass from one philosophy to another and to a third. People see nothing alarming in that kind of evolution. They believe it's all in the ordering of things. And, you know, you could look at that as like the law of succession again, right? And Shestov says, nah, there's something else going on here. An awareness of the fact that it's us who decides whether we want to adopt a philosophical perspective or not. It's up to us. We get to choose. And so he says, um, to those of us who fought so long against all kinds of constancy, 
The levity of the young is a pleasant sight. They will don materialism, positivism, conscientism, spiritualism, and so on, one after another, till they realize that all theories, ideas, and ideals are as of little consequence as the hoop skirts and crinolines of our grandmothers. And so living without being confined by the law of sequence within the realm of ideas is something that Shestov thinks uh, can be quite useful. I mean, it might also turn a person into a superficial dilettante, quite true, who treats philosophies essentially as cultural products to swap out for each other. But it also opens up the possibility of, you know, to go back to the parable of the pike, going beyond the partition if the partition has been removed. And so we shouldn't be great believers or trusters in the laws of regular succession, we could, we could say, well, everything I'm observing tells me that things you know, succeed each other. And when I drop this piece of chalk, it's going to fall. But things could be different. Things could always go otherwise. And particularly when we're thinking about human affairs and the world of ideas, this notion of strict causality and sequence is probably more and more restrictive and out of place.